three of uh, Song of Solomon, Here Comes the Bride. And uh, it's a beautiful little book tucked away in the middle of the Old Testament. Historically, the Jews understood Song of Solomon uh, to be an allegory of the love between Jehovah and Israel. And Christians in the New Testament, we understand it on an even deeper level, to be an allegory of the love between Christ and his church. Now, I have to say uh, that in recent years, studying the allegory and the typology and the symbolism of Scripture has come to be frowned upon by many liberal scholars. They don't want us to do that anymore. In effect, they say that we should treat the Bible like any other historical religious book. But in response to that trend, I would offer these thoughts about the often criticized and misunderstood little book of Song of Solomon. First of all, this is a song. Somebody say, it's a song. And so it's one unified poem. It's just not a collection of random poems and random romantic writing. This is a song, the Song of Solomon. Secondly, guess what? This is in the Bible. And so if it's in the Bible, this is authoritative, it is anointed, it is powerful, and it is relevant to us in some way. Thirdly, you saw this one coming, this little book is about love. It celebrates human marriage, but in a particular way. It celebrates human marriage as a divine portrait. And this book is also tucked away at the end of what we call the wisdom literature of the Bible. That's Psalms and Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, uh, Song of Solomon is in there. It's a beautiful, beautiful little book. But, but he, here's what you've got to know. This is written for a specific purpose, to instruct and to inspire us spiritually. It's definitely intended for that. And finally, uh, if you didn't uh, know all of that already, you would realize this if you have an open heart and open ears in the spirit. This book is about the son of David. Now, of course, immediately and historically, that's Solomon. But there's another son of David in the Bible. And that is the Lord Jesus. That's one of his messianic titles. So yes, this is about King Solomon and his bride, but it's also about Jesus and his bride. And in fact, if, if you want to uh, really kind of dig down into this, Jesus himself gives us permission uh, to do this. When he walked with those two disciples after his resurrection on the, the road, here's what he said. The Bible says, Luke wrote this down, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures. Someone say, all the scriptures. So he just walked through the pages of the Old Testament. And in all the scriptures, he showed them things concerning himself. And John records the words of Jesus to a crowd one day. And Jesus said this, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. I don't care what part of the Bible you open to. Somewhere in that chapter, somewhere in that book, somewhere on that page, if you look long enough, there's a testimony pointing to Jesus. It happens everywhere. It happens in creation. It happens in the flood. It happens in the exodus. It happens in the tabernacle. It happens in the lion's den and the fiery furnace and the captivity. It happens in the all of the devastation and the destruction and the victories and the battles because the scriptures testify of him. Now, that being said, this book is ancient Eastern poetry. So it's different than many other sections of the Bible, and it's different than what we're used to. It flows back and forth between various speakers. It shifts seamlessly from scene to scene. It doesn't have much of a definite storyline like we would uh, read a novel or write a novel today. But despite this loose structure, and this is important for you to kind of lock in your mind, Despite that loose structure, most scholars have still come to an agreement concerning the following outline of the book. Three sections. They describe the bride and the bridegroom. 
first in their engagement, then at their wedding, and finally in their early marriage. And those sections, we'll talk about it in a bit tonight, but they're separated by two haunting dreams that the bride has. She fears that her beloved has left her. So when you take the Song of Solomon as a whole, it is a picture of a man and a woman being united in a lifelong covenant of marriage. And it's a beautiful portrait of Jesus and his bride, the church, being united in a lifelong covenant of salvation. Uh, the marriage covenant is, is basically these three stages. We leave our family of origin, we cleave to the one that we have chosen and God has chosen for us, and then we begin to weave our lives together, and it's meant to be that way. Now, tonight, uh, I, I'm so excited to teach this. Uh, we want to look at this book through the eyes of the bride. She remains nameless throughout this entire poem, and she is simply referred to as the Shulamite, in chapter 6, verse 13, meaning only that she is from a little tiny village named Shunem. And it's right there in the middle of the, the map on the screen in a little circle. She is a country girl. Her tiny village is located in the Jezreel Valley in northern Israel. That's what you're looking at, is northern Israel. And that fertile plain that her little village was in was in the lower Galilee region, south of the Sea of Galilee, but northern Israel. It's not too far from Mount Gilboa, and it's part of the territory that was originally allotted to the tribe of Issachar. Now, Shunem is where the Philistines camped when they fought that final fatal battle against King Saul, and he and his son Jonathan died. It's where the Philistines set up camp, engaging in that battle. Shunem was the hometown of Abishag, a young virgin maiden chosen to serve King David in the last days of his life. And Shunem was the place, you might remember this from your Bible stories, where the prophet Elisha often stayed, in a little chamber that was prepared for him by a godly, childless couple. And when the prophet continually traveled through little old Shunem, they set up a, a chamber for him, and he stayed there often, regularly. And they received the miracle of a son in their old age when the prophet prayed for them. And then a few years later, that boy died. He was out in the field working with his father, and he, he had a, a terrible uh, pain in his head. He got back to the house, and he actually died on his mother's lap. It was a tragedy. But he was raised from the dead through Elisha's ministry. And then if you fast forward to the New Testament, in the nearby city of Nain, they're so close the dots on the map are, are touching, uh, in the nearby city of Nain, there was another young man raised from the dead by the Lord Jesus during his earthly ministry. And so uh, th this is the spot we're talking about in uh, th this particular book. This is where this all happened. The Song of Solomon tells the story of an unlikely relationship between this anonymous Shulamite girl and King Solomon, who just happens to be the world-famous leader of her nation. He is at the height of his power. He is presiding over the golden age of Israel and many people, rulers even, from other nations, they travel for long distances just to see his wealth and hear his wisdom for themselves. The most famous one, of course, being the Queen of Sheba, who later came to see Solomon's wealth and wisdom. Solomon is not only the builder of God's glorious temple, but he's also the chief architectural and engineering genius behind hundreds of building projects all throughout the nation. His fame and his wealth and his wisdom are unparalleled in history. We read this a couple of weeks ago from his later writing in Ecclesiastes. Solomon said, I made me great works, I builded me houses, I planted me vineyards, I made me gardens and orchards, and I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruit. I made me pools of water to water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. And I read that scripture to pull out one word, 
Solomon said, I planted vineyards everywhere in Israel. That's the king. He is world famous. If they had magazines, his face would be on every one of them. The Shulamite girl, on the other hand, she comes from very humble origins. She and her family eke out a meager, pauper existence. They, they try to scrabble together this living in the vineyards in the hills around Shunem. And tending vineyards, especially in that day, it is arduous, back-breaking work. Long, long days spent outside under the burning sun, irritating insect bites and painful scratches from reaching in and pruning the vines, constant walking and constant carrying heavy bushels of grapes and getting dirty and sticky from picking grapes. And then you, that's to say nothing of having to chase away the foxes and ward off thieves and other predators that try to either steal or attack or in the case of the animals, just eat up your vineyard. So it was terrible taxing work. It was common in Bible times for the king to essentially own the entire country. And all the citizens essentially served the king as his servants. So that's very important. Because that meant every piece of property, every field and farm, every garden and vineyard belonged to the king. In fact, this was, if you remember, this was the prophet Samuel's warning when Israel first said they wanted a king so they could be like other nations. Samuel leveled with them. He said, if you have a king, he will take your fields and your vineyards, and your olive yards. He'll take the best of them. He'll give them to his servants. And he'll take the tenth of your seed and your vineyards, and he'll give to his officers and to his servants. You are going to become employees of the kingdom if you choose to have a king. And that's exactly what happened. A century after Solomon lived and ruled, this absolute authority of the Jewish king would become the source of a major dispute between a guy named King Ahab and one of his subjects named Naboth. And Naboth, unfortunately, owned a beautiful, flourishing vineyard, but it just happened to be in sight of the royal palace in Samaria. And when Naboth refused to give up his inheritance, wicked King Jezebel orchestrated his death just so her husband could take possession of it. Ahab had offered uh, to take it. He said to Naboth, give me your vineyard that I might have it for a garden of herbs because it's near to my house. I can see it from the palace. I'll give thee for it a better vineyard than it or if it seem good to thee, I'll give thee the worth of it in money. In other words, he said, you could take money or I'll trade you another vineyard, but you are giving me that vineyard because he was the king. And when he didn't get it that way, his wife, Queen Jezebel, orchestrated Naboth's death through false accusation. And one more time, the king got it. He controlled everything. Now, while some rulers like Saul and Ahab abused this absolute authority, other rulers in Israel were so beloved by their subjects that even though they were absolute monarchs, it really didn't create much of a conflict during their reign. But make no mistake about it. To put it mildly, the king, whoever he was, the king owned everything and controlled everyone. Period. And that was the case during the reign of King Solomon. He owned every field, every farm, every garden in Israel, including his vineyard, near the tiny village of Shunem. And though his subjects had to do all the hard work year round, they were permitted, they did all the work, but they were permitted to keep only one-sixth of the produce and the profits from their labor, while the other five-sixth went to King Solomon. And the Bible tells us specifically that King Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Hamon. He let out the vineyard unto keepers. 
Every one for the fruit thereof was to bring a thousand pieces of silver. So a thousand pieces of silver went to Solomon. My vineyard which is mine is before me. Thou, O Solomon, must have a thousand. You get a thousand pieces of silver. And those that keep the fruit thereof, they only get 200 pieces of silver. They do all the work, but because you're the king, you get five-sixths of the produce and the profit. They get one-sixth. Now the main characters in this story, in this song, in this poem, in this book that's in your Bible, they move in totally different orbits. They live in totally different worlds. So when you look at King Solomon, who owns the whole country, who controls everything, and you look at this anonymous, nameless, humble, peasant, obscure Shulamite girl, let me just say it. Their meeting is improbable. Their love is inconceivable. And to think about them getting married, that is absolutely unimaginable. But this is where the story takes an unexpected turn. You see, the Shulamite girl and her family, they just happen to serve among the keepers of Solomon's vineyard at Baal Haman. The king has leased the property. He has let the, out the vineyard. He has uh, leased it to the keepers so the citizens of the area work in his vineyard including the Shulamite girl and her family. The name Baal Haman, it means Lord of a multitude or place of a multitude or if you go back to the root of it, it means possessor of abundance. And it was called that Baal Haman because Solomon's vineyards in northern Israel they are extensive and they are productive. It's amazing. It's not only beautiful, it's a source of great wealth and abundance. And it will be somewhere among those vast vineyards that an anonymous peasant girl will first meet the most famous king in the world. Now there's a lot more to this beautiful story and we'll get there next week and the week after. But for now... Let's just suffice it to say that this will be love at first sight. We already read this a couple weeks ago, but it's, it's one of the most familiar and powerful paragraphs in this whole little poem. It's in the last chapter when the Shulamite girl says, Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm, for love is as strong as death. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire which hath a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would utterly be condemned. It would be rejected if you tried to buy love. You can't do it. See, at the end of this book, in the rearview mirror, the Shulamite girl looks back over their relationship. And she says, our love had to weather many, many obstacles. And she's thankful that the true love between her and Solomon, even though it was unlikely and improbable and most people thought impossible, she says it showed itself to be stronger than any obstacles. It was stronger than death. It, it was stronger than any opposition. It, it, it was uh, more powerful than this jealousy which can be so cruel. And you want to believe that this girl marrying the king of Israel, she had some people that were jealous of her. Because this love, the reason it survived, the reason it overcame obstacles and opposition, the reason they weathered the storms is because this love burned in their hearts, she says, with a vehement flame. Their true love proved itself to be unquenchable. Even when the floods of difficulty and the trials of life tried to drown it. And that's why she says at the end of this little poem, true love is so priceless that it cannot be bought or sold. It can only be given freely to one another. You can't buy love. You can't buy it for yourself. You can't buy it from anybody else. True love cannot be bought. It has to be freely given. 
This is, according to the Word of God in the Old and New Testament, this is the kind of love that married couples should have for each other. But let me go a little further. It is also the kind of love that God's people in God's family should have for each other. The New Testament says in that famous love chapter that we like to read at wedding ceremonies, love suffers long and it's kind. Love envies not. Love doesn't vaunt itself. It is not puffed up with pride. It doesn't behave itself unseemly. Love, charity in the King James, love doesn't seek her own. It is not easily provoked. Love thinks no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. And then this, this is amazing. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. And love endures all things. When you've got true love, you'll put up with a lot because you love. You'll believe the best because you love. You will continue to hope for a better future after the trials are past because you love. And you will endure whatever life throws at you because you love. Married couples, that's a word for you. But church family, that's a word for us. Because true love among the people of God does not instantly believe the worst that you heard about somebody. True love among the people of God puts up with a little bit of inconvenience from people once in a while. You know, the, the saying in life is true in the church that you can pick your friends but you're stuck with your relatives. Anybody ever heard that? Well, that's true in the family of God too. And I'm grateful that God saved every one of you that are in here and every one of you that are uh, watching at home. I'm grateful for the family of God. But the family of God is not a business. The family of God is not some kind of, uh, of association. The family of God is a family. And in families, we love each other. And that love is like the love that's written about here. It can't be purchased. It's freely given. So, this is the story for tonight. From the perspective of the bride, a peasant girl from Shunem, this know-nothing town way up in the outskirts of northern Israel, this little hole in the wall, spot in the road, and this anonymous, nameless, poor pauper peasant girl she would no doubt face opposition to such an unlikely, unusual relationship. Think about it. Other members of the royal family, nobles working in the royal palace, even the citizens of Israel, probably hundreds of people tried to talk Solomon out of this. Most of Israel would certainly feel like King Solomon could certainly do better for himself than a pauper girl from an invisible town in northern Israel. No doubt, when this first began to be noised abroad, first began to be known, thank God they didn't have Facebook back then. But no doubt, when it first began to be known, people gossiped about her and criticized her and perhaps even mocked her. This peasant girl without the classy accent and without the nice clothes and, and without the good upbringing. And that would hurt. So the Shulamite girl that we read about that tells her story in this poem, in this Song of Solomon, she was no doubt a wounded bride. No doubt at all. But to be frank, the love of a king could easily overcome any of the obstacles that I just mentioned. He owns the whole country. He controls everything. If she's the girl he wants, she's the girl he gets. And if anybody has anything too negative to say, he can deal with it. He's the king of the whole country. And that's why. As we read this story, 
as we read through this song, this beautiful poetic book in your Bible, we gradually become aware that most of the Shulamite's obstacles don't come from her present. They, they don't come from other people. Most of the obstacles she faces, if you read it carefully, they actually come from her past and they come from her perception about herself. Now I'll jump ahead to the end. Most of your problems in life come from your past choices and your perception about yourself, not from what you are dealing with in the present and definitely not from other people. There, that's my punchline. You can leave now if you want. Now, that was the case for the Shulamite girl. Read the story. She's embarrassed of her upbringing. She's intimidated by other people. She, she, she doesn't know where she fits in this whole scheme of things. But that doesn't come from Solomon. That doesn't come from the romance she's experiencing. It comes from her past and it comes from her perception. There are thousands of variants on the folk tale that we know in English as Cinderella. Thousands of them. And those variants on this tale that we call Cinderella are known and loved throughout the world and throughout a good chunk of human history. And in these Cinderella stories, the protagonist is always a young woman living in forsaken circumstances. And her circumstances are suddenly changed to remarkable fortune all because of her ascension to the throne by marriage. That's what's universal in all the variants of the Cinderella tales throughout the world. Although the story's um, title and the, the story's main characters, their names change in different languages. In English, the word Cinderella has come to mean a person whose beauty and attributes were previously unrecognized. A person who unexpectedly achieves recognition or success after a long period of obscurity and neglect and even abuse. That's a Cinderella. We use the word and when we say it, we know what we mean. In secular literature, the earliest variant of the Cinderella story was recounted by the Greek philosopher Strabo during the lifetime of Jesus. He told of a Greek slave girl named Rhodopis who eventually married the king of Egypt. So in his day and in his story, Rhodopis was Cinderella. But nearly a thousand years before Strabo's fictional story, there was a real life Cinderella who first caught the attention of the world famous ultra wealthy, incredibly wise, and probably good looking king of Israel. The Shulamite girl had a natural beauty that went totally unnoticed due to her grubby face and her grimy hands, her tangled hair, her threadbare clothes, and her tattered appearance. Nobody gave her a second look. Within one moment of meeting her, in chapter one of this book, she is already apologizing that she is sunburned from working outside all the time. She makes excuses for her shabby self-presentation. Look what she says. She said, I am, I am black. The sun has looked upon me. I'm sunburned. And, and she says, uh, my own vineyard. I, I work in a vineyard, but my own vineyard I have not kept. She's apologizing already and we only just met her. She abruptly blurts out the reason for her low self-confidence. Watch what she says. My mother's children were angry with me. Not my brothers, not my sisters, not my siblings. My mother's children. She has stepbrothers and stepsisters. This is Cinderella. And they abuse her. She tells immediately, she just blurts it out. They treated me harshly. They forced me to endure the long, difficult days in the vineyard. And those long, difficult days working outside all the time have now marred her beauty and the abuse has damaged 
her dignity. No wonder this girl has issues. She said, I am black but comely. I'm pretty underneath. But you'd never know it from looking at me. I'm so scorched and burned from the sun and scratched from the vineyards. O oh, you daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon. And again, she makes the same uh, comparison. Kedar, that was a nomadic group of people that traveled, and they, they had tents as they traveled, and they wove them out of black goat's hair. And so she said, I'm burned with the sun. I look like the tents of Kedar, but if you could see inside, it's like the curtains that Solomon hangs in his palace or in that glorious temple. I'm really pretty inside, but you just can't tell. Because life has scorched me and burned me and scarred me and hurt me. Look not upon me because I am black, because the sun has looked upon me. I am, I am so burned, my, my skin is peeled, it's blistered. I, I'm a mess. My face is grimy, my hands are grubby. My mother's children were angry with me. We're at verse 6 in chapter 1. She just meets you and her inferiority just overflows. My mother's children were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards. They forced me to do all the heavy, hard work. But mine own vineyard have I not kept. Now twice in the Song of Solomon, the Shulamite will have haunting dreams where she will be tormented by the thought that her beloved has left her. The first time that she has this haunting, terrible dream is just before their wedding. You can read about it in the first few verses of chapter 3. The second time she has a very similar haunting dream is during the early days of their marriage. You can read about that in the first few verses of chapter 5. And the details differ between the two dreams, but the panic she feels is exactly the same. In both dreams, she leaps from her bed to run through the streets of the city. She's frantically searching, going door to door and gate to gate and street to street, frantically searching for her bridegroom. In both dreams, she pleads with the watchman of the city. And she says, have you seen my beloved? I've lost him. He's left me. He's gone. I can't find him. But in the second dream, it gets even worse. The watchmen strike her and wound her. And even worse than all of that, in the second dream that she has, we think, in the early days of her marriage, it's really a nightmare. In her second dream, it's her own fault that her beloved is gone. Because she was too sleepy to get up and answer the door when he came home and knocked. And that haunts her. And she has a nightmare about it. Here's how she recounts that second dream. She said, I sleep, but my heart waketh. My heart longs to see him. My heart longs to be with him, but my body's asleep. I'm, 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 I'm asleep. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled, for my head is filled with dew and my locks with the drops of the night. It's raining out here. It's cold out here. I, I want to come in. And her beloved, in her dream, it haunts her. He's knocking at the door. And the first time, he just disappeared, and she didn't know where he was. But this time when she wakes, she knows that he was knocking at the door and she could have invited him in, but she was too lazy, she was too sleepy, she was too comfortable to get up. And so he leaves. And then it happens again. She, uh, she takes off running through the city, going from door to door and gate to gate and street to street and talking to the watchman trying to find him. You see, she opened the door just a bit too late. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself, and he was gone. My soul failed when he spake. I could imagine I was hearing his voice, and, and my heart sunk, and my soul failed. My emotions, everything just kind of dropped because I was responsible this time for not being able to be with my beloved. I sought him, but I could not find him. 
I called him, but he gave me no answer. I push pause at this point in this little lesson to tell you that your relationship with God is not some kind of religious ritual that you go through. It is a relationship. And you know from life that relationships don't always just go along predictably. And relationships can be messy. And relationships, there can be misunderstandings sometimes. Please hear me. God is not a power. He is a person. He has likes and dislikes. He has loves and hates. You are not one of his hates. You are his love. And so, it's her fault. She says, I sought him, but I couldn't find him. Could we be honest enough to say that sometimes in your relationship with your Lord and Savior, you felt like that? I sought him, but I couldn't find him. I tried to get in touch with him, but it seemed like the heavens were brass and my emotions were shut down and I was doing everything that I knew to do, but there was this nagging doubt in the back of my mind that somehow I was responsible for severing that closeness and that connection. You've had the same nightmare. It might not have involved the streets of Jerusalem, but you've had that same nightmare. He's gone. He left me. What am I going to do? I sought him, but I couldn't find him. Here it is. I called him, but he gave me no answer. I think we could all at least be honest enough in this room to say there are times that we've called on the Lord and it sure felt like he did not answer. In fact, as a pastor and having served in this congregation for a few years, I can look around this room. I can look around our congregation. I can, I can imagine in my mind somebody watching me from home right now. And I can say, we called on the Lord for that request. We called on Him for that need. And from our limited earthly human perspective, it sure does seem that we called and He did not answer. You've had that nightmare just like she had it. You've had those deep, dark nights of the soul when you wondered if you'd done something wrong and God had walked away, closed the door, left you to your own devices. You've had those times when you were cold. You've had those times when you were spiritually lazy. You've had those times when you were spiritually asleep and he was knocking. But something else got your attention, something else took your energy, you were too distracted, you were too tired, you were too whatever. And he knocked and you didn't answer. And then the nightmare. He's gone. He's left me. Oh, you don't have to be honest. I'll be honest for you. It has happened to every single person who ever has had a relationship with the Lord Jesus. Because this is not a religious ritual you are doing. This is a life you are living with a real God who loves you so fiercely that he came to this planet and shed his blood so he could marry you. You are his beloved. You are his bride. You are his church. You've had that same nightmare. The prophet Jeremiah years later, would make a, a similar plaintive appeal from the Lord. Jeremiah would let us know that when the bridegroom calls, it's very important to answer. And from the perspective of God, he says, the prophet says, can a maid forget her ornaments or a bride her wedding dress? Yet my people have forgotten me. This is the heartbreaking part. Days without number. You might not miss it when you don't talk to Jesus. But Jesus misses it when you don't talk to Jesus. You might not miss it when you don't have time to pray. But Jesus misses it when you don't have time to pray. Could a bride 
forget every way, everything she was going to use to dress up and be beautiful for her wedding day? Obviously not. That would be crazy to even think about it. But just as crazy, God says through the prophet, but my people, they've forgotten me. Days without number. Say, Pastor, that's heavy. Yeah, it is. It is. But at the same time, it's extremely important for us to realize that despite our failures in the past and our distractions in the present or our fears for the future, if you don't hear anything else, please hear this. You may have messed it up, failed, fallen, all of it. You may have been responsible for the distance and the disconnection in your relationship with the heavenly bridegroom, but please hear me. When the bride does call, the bridegroom always answers. When the bride makes up her mind, see the Bible still says, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, God said, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. I will heal their land. When the bride makes up her mind to go after the bridegroom, he's very interested in this relationship. Jeremiah said this later in his prophecy, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and I will show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. That's God's word to you tonight. Call unto me, and I will answer thee. If you'll call, I'll answer. If you'll call, I'll answer. Yes, the Shulamite girl was a wounded bride. But if you read this book carefully and closely, you will come to realize that most of her wounds were self-inflicted. The obstacles in her relationship with Solomon actually came from her past and from her perception. He hadn't really left her. That was a bad dream. He hadn't really left her. Why? Because he loved her. And the love of a king is a powerful thing. It was then and it still is today. <laughs> would you lift up your hands? I'm almost finished. Would you lift up your hands and let your voice out? And would you call on him? Because here's what he promised in his word. If you'll call on me, I'll answer you. If you'll draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. That's what he promised in his word. So I don't care who you are or what you've done or how many things you've messed up in your life. I don't care what kind of a list of failures is attached to your name. If you'll call on him, he'll answer you. If you'll draw nigh to him, he'll draw nigh to you. You don't have to worry about it. It's, a, it, it, it's said. It's decreed. It's done with in God's word. If you'll call, I will answer. Oh, let your voice out, church, in this room, at home. If you're watching with us, I hope you're praying with us. God wants to hear you. God wants to hear from you. God wants to touch you. God's presence wants to invade wherever it is you are that you're watching. He did it on Sunday. I had so many people text or write or call and say, Pastor, God's presence invaded our living room on Sunday. Let me tell you, he wants to do the same thing again. He doesn't want to visit with you once a week week. He wants to invade your life every day because he loves you. He hasn't left you. He loves you. And the love of a king is a powerful thing. I worship you, Jesus. Huh. His presence is in this room. It saturates his people. <laughs> I worship you, God. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. And because the love of a king is a powerful thing, and because he has promised he will never leave us, this is exactly why the most common command in your Bible, and there are many, many commands in the Bible, but the most common command in the Bible is fear not over and over and over and over. 
there are all kinds of commands. We study them, we read them, we, we practice them, we try to live them, the commands of Scripture. But the most common command God issues to His people is, would you stop being afraid? Fear not. My goodness, there's a lot to fear in the world today. There are people who are panicked over all kinds of crazy things. And then there are the main issues, the real issues, the worldwide issues, the stresses and frustrations and problems and tensions that are real and we have to be concerned about them. And in the middle of all of that, the most common command in your Bible from your bridegroom is fear not. And the most common promise in your Bible and oh, there are many. You can easily have a prom promise for every day of the year and way more than that. There are so many great promises in the Word of God. But the most common promise in the Word of God is, I will be with you. <laughs> Not I'll fix everything. I wish that was in there. Boy, that would be fun to preach, wouldn't it? But that's not in there. But I'll tell you what is in there. Whatever you're going through, however you've messed up, whatever failures are on the list that you're ashamed of, I will be with you. So fear not. The most common promise and the most common command in the word of God. And sometimes they get put together. Isaiah said, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. Oh my goodness, I want to say that right in the middle of somebody's life tonight. Right in the middle of somebody's situation. If I could, I'd just like to penetrate somebody's mind and heart with that and calm you down and let you know it's going to be okay. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. You may feel like the bottom fell out, but it didn't, because underneath are the everlasting arms. Underneath is the strong hand of God's power and righteousness. So fear not, because God is with you. Don't be dismayed, because he is your God. Not your bank account, not our government, not your health diagnosis. No, he is your God, and if he's on your side, you are going to be okay. You are going to make it. Fear not, for I am with you. The Shulamite girl eventually learned that nothing could separate her from the love of her bridegroom, who just happened to be the king of the whole country. He not only owned everything, he controlled everything. And she eventually figured that out. But this is what's important for you tonight. Just because he owned everything and controlled everything, and it was all going to be okay, that did not make her more casual about their relationship. It actually made her more committed. And she says, right in this little piece of poetry, she decides that she's going to hold him tight. I found him whom my soul loveth. I held him and would not let him go. That's a beautiful love story. That's a better God story. I found the one that my soul loveth. And I'm holding on to him. And I will not let him go. Go. Oh, it's a beautiful love story. It's a way better God story. I found the one who forgave my past. I found the one who heals my diseases. I found the one who forgave my sin. I found the one who encourages me and lifts me up. I found the one who binds up my broken heart. I found the one whom my soul loveth. So I held him and I will not let him go. For me, that was way better. Back when I was 12 years old, that's when I was born again. That's been a lot of water under the bridge and a lot of years on the calendar. But guess what? I still love him. I'm still holding him. And I still will not let him go. But guess what? He still loves me. He's still holding me. And he will not let me go. 
Oh, we need to worship for a moment. I'm just about caught away with this. I found the one that my soul loves. That's why I don't have much patience with all the junk in the world because I found the one who supersedes anything I've ever seen. He's greater than anything I've ever known. He can do so many miraculous things. He is the reason I live and move and have my being. I found the one that my soul loves and I'm holding him and I will not let him go. Oh. Oh, my. Let your voice out. Let your hands go in the air. Express your love. You are the bride. He is the bridegroom. I worship you, Jesus. Oh, my. Oh, my. Jesus, I love you, God. I love you, God. I love you, Jesus. Please join us at home wherever you are and whatever you're watching this on. Just make that place a sanctuary right now. Because the king of all kings is not limited to this room and he's not limited to this sermon. He's not limited to this address. He is with you. He is for you. I wish some spirit-filled people would give vent to the spirit of God that is in you and just pray. We're like two scriptures away from the end, but I just want you to pray. I just want you to pray. I'm so glad I found you, Jesus. I'm so glad you found me, Jesus. I'm so glad that I get to hold on to you, but I'm even more glad that you're holding on to me. I worship you, God. I worship you, God. <laughs> oh my oh my I worship you Jesus This is why God's people live godly lives, righteous lives, holy lives in an ungodly, unrighteous, unholy generation. What Peter called on the day of Pentecost an untoward generation. Evil's called good and good's called evil. It's just backwards and upside down and so messed up. It's an un toward an unseemly generation. But the reason we live the way we do is not because of rules. It's because of relationship. It's not because of law. It's because of love. I found him whom my soul loveth. I held him and I would not Yes, 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 yes. I know it's Bible study, but this is really important. We don't want to just kind of be sleepy and then he passes by and then we're fearful we missed it. Let's not miss it. Would you reach out to the Lord in Bible study tonight? We got time for this. We've got time for this. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. <laughs> oh, my. Oh, my. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. 
Oh, I worship you, Jesus. You see, brothers and sisters, holding on tight works both ways. I am very grateful that God is never going to let go of me. But I return that love by saying, I will never let go of him. I'm so grateful that, that God is holding me. But I reciprocate that love by saying, I'm holding him. Nothing is going to get between me and my beloved. Holding on tight works both ways. It is biblical. God is never going to forsake me. I'm his child. I'm his bride. God is never going to forsake me. So is the response to that, this casual, loose kind of connection to my relationship with him? No. My response to the fact that he is never going to forsake me is that I am never going to forsake him. This is for life. This is forever. We always read this verse and we always think about these things can't separate us from God. So, you know, no matter what I face, God's going to be there for me. I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And if you're like me, we usually read that thinking that God's love is holding on to us and protecting us and guarding us. So none of these things can separate us from God's love because he's doing all the work and, 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 and he's undertaken. And, and for sure, he's the king of all kings. He owns everything. He controls everything. So for sure, he's got all the power. But let me tell you, there's another sense to that. It's not just him holding on to me. I am holding on to him for dear life. I have grabbed him and I will not let him go. So from my end of things, I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels or principalities or powers or anything in my present or anything to come in my future nor height nor depth or any other creature... Nothing is going to be able to separate me. On God's end, that's true. But on my side, that's true too. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I don't know about you, but I found him whom my soul loveth. I don't have it all together like the Shulamite I am for sure. A wounded bride but I have found the one whom my soul loveth. And I've had enough times when I've been cold and casual. I've had enough times when I've been disconnected. I've had enough times when I was distracted. I found him whom my soul loveth. I held him. And I would not let him go. Can I just tell you? That'll get you through. That will save your life. That will get you through any valley, any trial, any loss, any pain, any hurt, any doubt. I found the one who my soul loveth. I held on to him. Devil, you hear me. I will not let him go. World, you hear me. I will not let him go. Opposition, every kind of trouble and trial and force. I will not let him go. It's not a religion. <laughs> it's a relationship. Oh, my. 